Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Direct Connect here with Nick Weber. Uh, we decided to do something a little bit different today instead of talking about some compliance related topic. Well, I guess it is compliance related. Nick and I wanted to pull out a few stories from, uh, from our, our old audit days. Uh, give you a little bit of, a little bit of insight into how things were, uh, you know, working on audit teams, some of the things that you, we, we'd see some of the very memorable experiences we've had, uh, you know, along with, uh, some of those audit experiences. Um, a lot of stories, unfortunately, I don't think we can tell, uh, to protect some of them are, are going to have to be saved for Archer after dark. Yeah. You got to find out yeah, some there, of the there's events some Archer and... after dark stories that, uh, you know, we want to protect the innocent where possible. Um, but you know, really maybe protect the guilty. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to say company it. included. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. Uh, but uh, yeah, we got some some interesting stories. But first, I think we wanted to start off a little bit of insight into kind of what goes into an audit. Um, specifically, a, uh, a I don't know. A lot of people don't know these things exist, but there's a there's a giant spreadsheet at least at WEC that we used to use the the ATL tracker. You know, if you were the audit team lead. You had this tracker, and it was, you know, a lot of tasks and various things you needed to make sure got done. Um, you know, check that box, make sure, you know, we'll talk about some of those things. Anyway, so that, that's kind of one of those things we'll talk about, and I'm sure our discussion will very quickly um, <clears throat> spiral downward into some pretty crazy stories about uh, some of those experiences and, and some good stories, you know, a lot of good donut runs and things like that. But I don't know, Nick, you want to you wanna talk about the tracker? Yeah, I was just just actually pulled up one of the old ones from back when I was brand new at WEC ten years ago. That, that can't be right. Dude, no, that was only like two or three years ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, looking through that and that brought back some memories, like the pre audit notification. Um, honestly, it reminded me of when you and I were still new, and there was a person at WEC who was in charge of putting all those packages together. Who we're not entirely sure, but we think was trying to get fired. Yeah, well, again, not entirely sure, but. Making mistakes that didn't make sense. Um, and Brent stuck that person with both Brian and I for yep. like a year and a half as we were new. So it was like finding extra Easter eggs or grading your kid's preschool homework. I don't even know how yeah. to describe it. Yeah, there, I mean, but there having, were a lot of things that just, you know, everything goes in order, right? There's there's yeah. a certain system. There's a certain order of when things go out. And, and it really felt like this individual was deliberately messing up that order, including numbering DRs. I mean, you, you, how many times do we have to pull back DRs? Of, oh, wait, that wasn't DR number 32. It was, you know, DR 26 or whatever. So if you had an audit 2013, 2014 <laughs> that Brian or I led, you may be entitled to compensation. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's the behind the scenes on that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, two rookie ATLs at that point, given somebody that was trying to manage somebody who didn't want to be there yep. and trying to manage that process that we didn't fully understand yet, so... And, and that was and always fun. Boot, again, a lot of people don't see the dynamic, you know, in the audit team and the, on the backside, um, you oh. know, behind closed doors, whatever you want to call it. But there's a lot of personalities. There's a lot of opinions. There's a lot of, you know, varying motives. And, and it can be, it can be challenged. And I think, Nick, you and I were fortunate we had, uh, well, I think it was one of the best audit teams, you know, ever, of course, because you or I were on it. I mean, yeah. but it, but it, it didn't come without its challenges, right? There's still, still a lot of. Yeah, a lot of back and forth and a lot of learning and, and that. And we, we generally got along pretty well with the O&P team, but that was kind of like a step-sibling relationship. Where <laughs> it was. Some days you're best friends and some days don't touch my drum set. It just, yep. That was always fun to, to manage, too. And so, No, it wasn't drum set. It was don't touch my printer. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so that's still a running joke. If you ever see Brian and he's looking to pack on anything, just tell him, don't forget the printer. Yep, don't forget the printer. Uh, you can yeah. physically watch his body tense right there. It's one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, you get stuck in a small room with 20 of your favorite work acquaintances for a week at a, at a time. Yeah. That, that, you that get to know each other pretty well, and you, you kind of understand what you can get away with, what you can't. <laughs> what, also, what on Nick, the, the positive side, you get to learn a lot, too. Yeah, definitely. What What Nick's really saying is you figure out which buttons you can push over and over and over again without... <laughs> you know, ending up in a brawl. So, you, yeah, 
We learned those personal could, interactions. We never got to brawl, but we got there was some yelling a couple times. Oh, yeah. It always just, it always surprised me who it was. Honestly, yep. it's usually the quiet ones. The quiet ones. Yep. Um, usually, and then you know the funny part about being in the auto is you spend all this time together on the road. You would all this time in the, you know during the day you know at the entity doing the audit. And then you all go out to dinner together. It's like you, you spend, I spend more time with the audit team than I did with my family. And you get to know people, like you said, really well. And, you know, you have a lot of fun, a lot of fun in different cities and that. Um, yeah. That's one of the questions I've heard coming around WICF lately is what Morgan does to keep his hair so lust, uh, luscious. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I know, but I'm not giving a secret away. I don't know uh, if he's got that right. patented or. Yeah. But you learn those things. Um, Speaking of Morgan, one of my favorite things at dinner was, uh, for those who don't know Morgan, pretty introverted, keeps to himself. So it was his birthday at least once a week whenever we were on the road. And it was yep. just hilarious because it was always the same thing. They'd bring out like a, the big sombrero, a cake with sparklers, and you'd hear that, oh, hell. Oh, hell. Come on, guys. Every time. Every time, man. It was, yeah, <laughs> it was a goal to make it Morgan's birthday as often as we could. And there was a couple times we'd... we'd button hook on that one like once when Darren was sitting next to him and made it yeah. Darren's birthday so Darren's all excited clapping and they put it down in front of him and throw the sombrero on Darren and <laughs> no no not me no it's not me <laughs> like no it is but literally I think I think Nick or I think uh, Morgan is probably I don't know he's got to be the age of Moses by now he's mm-hmm. 840 years I mean literally yeah. at least once I mean sometimes three or four nights a week we'd, we'd tell the waitress it was his birthday and and they would bring out the cake or the brownie or whatever it was. And it was just amazing. Just absolutely amazing, that reaction. So, yeah, yeah. we had a lot of fun with that. The other fun part of the audits was trying to help plan logistics. Yeah. That was, we actually started tracking a lot of things like, hey, here's the areas to stay. Here's where not. Because we'd ask the utility. But honestly, you ask somebody, hey, what's a great hotel in the place where you live and you sleep in your own bedroom mm-hmm. every night? They don't yeah. have a clue. Yep. Um, so we, we end up in a couple of places um <laughs> I remember one i stayed in i got there and i had a head cold so i couldn't smell and then like the third day it started to clear up and i realized they put me in a smoking room and <laughs> everything in my suitcase everything just reeked i was like man yeah there's been some there's definitely been some doozy hotels um especially when you get that. you get out in some of the smaller more rural places and you know your 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 options are limited and uh <clears throat> yeah it makes for some fun times Everyone's probably find the hidden gem though, like the random super nice hotel, like in the middle of a bunch of cow pastures. Where yeah. did this come from? Yeah. Um, my favorite one though was the one I think I was in ATL for it. When it was a nice hotel, we showed up like, man, we got good digs this time. Yeah. Got it. Walked into the room and there's earplugs in the nightstand. <laughs> kind of like that one. That's weird. Whatever. You go really down good. to dinner. Like that's I think odd. Brian, you might have been the one that brought it up, like at dinner. Like, yeah, yeah does anybody else get earplugs on their nightstand? What's with the earplugs, you know? and right. everybody else had noticed it. Nobody wanted to <laughs> say it. We found out that night that that town doesn't have a noise ordinance on the trains, and there's a train track right outside the hotel with a parking garage on the other side, and a substantial transient population. So they'd lay on the horn all the way through town to let everybody know yep. to get off the tracks like every hour. So every hour. All night. All night. All night. Well, we ended that out of the day early because we were ahead on some things, yeah. but it, we yeah, couldn't have gone another day. Everybody was punch drunk and stupid. I think we actually figured out on that one that somebody somebody was staying on the other side of the hotel that was like farther away from the train, and they didn't have earplugs. I'm like, how come you didn't have earplugs? And then you know it all it all kind of added up after the first night because just it, it, you think those train operators were probably like, oh, here comes that here comes that Marriott, you know, and like we're just mm-hmm. gonna lay on the horn the whole way through, and oh man, it was. It was impossible. I can guarantee that that audit did not have a whole lot of data requests because by the <laughs> end it was just, what can we do? I'm reasonably assured they're compliant. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was a high level of misery there. Now, so that gets into one of the other things I've noticed since leaving the audit team is how many people measure their audit success on number of data requests. Yes. Yes. There's this whole underground like fight club over who can who can have the least number of data requests and that, that equals success on the audit. And here to tell you it's not always the case it's rarely the case if you get your audit team put in a hotel where they're getting woken up every hour you're not going to have another <laughs> day request because they just want to go home yep um, yep yeah one of the other things i remember coming into some of the places where we didn't get into those stretches where we had back to back to back audits and there was one i remember if you were on it 
there was a few of us who traveled two weeks in a row, which is pretty rare. Mm -hmm. So our offsite for an audit, we were actually on site with another entity. So yeah. I think I sent like three data requests because I looked at everything and it looked pretty good. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I don't, I'm not going to dive. Whereas if I'd had another week, I would have dove just because I had time. Yeah, that's that's a that's another aspect. I think, uh, I guess, insight. You know that folks don't realize that your auditors are um, oftentimes overwhelmed. You know, with with the back to back audits. You know, I know at least we were, and that that did have a direct impact on how how much, you know, vigor, how much, you know, scrutiny you could put into a particular audit or the next audit, or you're sending out data requests for two or three audits down the road. Um, mm. Yeah, it gets hard to juggle. And, and believe it or not, yeah, the number of DRs you get could have actually been a function of how tired your auditor was. I mean, it's... How tired your auditor was? Who they saw last? Yeah. I mean, if they were somewhere where everything was really well organized and wired tight, and then you came in and maybe yours isn't quite as well organized, yeah. that... You're going to get more audit. It's kind of that recency bias. I mean, let that be a lesson. If you're going after somebody who's got some archer help in there, it's going to be a little harder for you. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Shameless plug. Yep. That's good. <clears throat> well, and two, it, it forced you, and, you know, we, we've talked about this before, Nick, but it forces you to get really good and very efficient, you know, finding what you need. Um, obviously, back when we were auditors, we didn't have the ERT. It wasn't driven that way. It was, you know, you, you had to go through all the documentation and, and extract. We had the... We had some templated ones though, like the SIP seven, the bomb DR. Yeah, the bomb. Some of those yep. big ones. Yeah, I had some of those, but it was it was trudging through that data, and you got very very efficient at it. I mean, you 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 learn very quickly to know. And and by the way, for the record, nobody reads the RSAW. Um, yeah, you know, that was a, that was a last resort. I'd rather have an interview than go back and read read the RSAW. But um, it yeah, we we learned how to get the job done. It was it was certainly certainly challenging in a lot of ways. Yeah, I always equate it to kind of flying over. A giant forest and you get 30,000 feet. Do I see any smoke? Yeah. Nope. Well, I'm going to hit the areas that I know might have something then and just kind of dial in from there. But yeah, we'd, we'd have some fun times with audit locations, you know, where they would, where they'd put us, you know, the audit teams would arrive on site. You know, some of the digs were, were nice. You know, they put us in a nice conference room somewhere. Uh, other times it was a single wide trailer, like out in a parking lot somewhere. They wanted us as far away from anybody and anything as possible. Fortunately, missed it, but I was on round two of the, the Rich Hyatt treatment, so I'm going to throw him under the bus all day long. <laughs> You're going to do it? All right. I'm going to, yeah. It was, I missed the first ones. It was right before I started Yeah. Uh, down in Arizona in August, held a two-hour safety briefing out on uh, blacktop <laughs> in the parking lot. I made yep. the audit team so miserable, they just wanted to get back into air conditioning. What he did to Mick and I was he forgot to tell us they, they changed the start time. So we get out to this power plant, hour and a half before Bill shows up, just watching Prairie Dogs for an hour and a half, <laughs> waiting, no cell coverage, middle of nowhere. Oh, and he shows up immediately apologizing. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you, you son of a... Yeah. Or, or the times when you, uh, you know, you had a four or five hour drive to do a site visit and you find out the entity, you know, had a plane and they had a nice and easy, a 30 minute flight and you were in the freaking car for four or five, six hours, you know, by the time you get See, there and... <laughs> I went the other way when I was running the audit. I found like, all right, we're all going to go the same direction. We're going to drive together. I'm going to find the nicest restaurant I can. I'm going to yeah. get y'all full of real good food and kind of yep. sleepy. It, it worked for all but one of the auditors. Yeah. It was always nice when they split out the O&P and SIP audit rooms. Yeah, that's true. It's always Mostly nice because there's, rooms. there's always two different major conversations going at any one time. And they're similar enough to be kind of confusing but different enough that they don't overlap. There was one time we were in one of the conference rooms that had a, you know, had a camera in it. And we remember, I don't remember if you were there in that one. I think you were where we, uh, you know, we're sitting there and like somebody kind of notices, Oh, there's this camera up in the corner and it was a PTZ. And as we're looking at it, it rotates, rotates around like facing us. And we're like, wait a minute, you know, like that's, that doesn't seem right. And so we <laughs> reach out to the entity like, Hey, what's going on in here? Yeah, and wonder how many of our rooms were bugged, you know? I'm not saying, Grant, that there was a camera in the audit room. I'm not saying there wasn't. <laughs> I will say there was no audio. We didn't have that, but... Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Might have been doing that to mess with Darren since he was the, team, the audit team manager then. And oh, yeah, that's right. I rarely miss an opportunity to mess with Darren. It's my, it's my hobby. Yep, love you, Darren. Some people, some people eat donuts. Some people collect things. <laughs> Leonard does Star Wars. I mess with Darren. That's what I eat. Yeah. 
Yeah. <clears throat> it's a whole reason to have a beard. Mess with Darren. Speaking of donuts, that's that's what got us started. You know, on the audit team, we we started doing donut runs kind of on the regular uh, back then. And, you know, as, as an auditor, you end up going back to a lot of the same cities, you know, multiple times. And so <clears throat> I have a crappy memory. So I, like, started keeping track. Of, like, hey, where have we been? Where was it good? You know, especially you go to L.A. and anywhere in Southern California, there's just tons of donut shops. So we we do a donut run a couple times a week and then started keeping track of it. And that, you know, that kind of snowballed and I have a lot of fun with that with you know the donuts, donuts the dough show and donuts on the side of things yeah it's kind of kind of growing the dough on empire the thing what was the best uh surprise good donut that you had we had that one you were with me as i remember it was one by the burbank airport and i can't i don't have the name in front oh, of me, but we happened to be that, yeah. we happened to have either we just shown up and we were early or we had extra time before the flight we we're flying out of burbank for whatever reason and there was that there was just a couple blocks from the airport and we hit that place and it was not premium donut times. You realize, you know, good donut times like it ends at like nine in the morning, right? And it was, it had to be here in Denver. Li- <laughs> True, it had to be late, you know, late in the morning or something. But we we stopped in there, and I remember it was it was phenomenal. Um, it's there's tough to go was- wrong with donuts in L.A. Yeah, it's very true. Very especially true. if it looks divey and shady, and like you might get shot in the parking lot. That's going to be a good donut. <laughs> or as Darren always said, it's, it's money laundering operation, right? <laughs> I'm not going to quote what our friend from MRO said about it. We'll just move on. <clears throat> I don't think there's enough bleep to bleep all that out. So no, we'll break Mark's bleep up. Yeah. Yeah. Food, food was a big thing for the auditors, right? I mean, we, Oh, remember when it was, it started to look like a rock star tour rider. That's when we decided we, we couldn't ask the entities to go get snacks for us anymore. Yeah. Yeah. There, like, there you was know some, what? if you want, there was some raw vegan, rest, vegan right? grass fed Wagyu beef jerky. You gotta get that yourself. Some of the requests from the auditors were, yeah, I just want all green M&Ms, you know, that kind of stuff. And, um, it started getting silly. That got, that got sideways. So we had to end up shopping for ourselves, right? Honestly, it was a win-win. We got, what we wanted yeah. it usually cost a lot less. There was yep. no drama around it, except for when, when we get on a health kick and then everybody who wasn't would get mad at us. Yeah. Not mad enough. They'd go get their own snacks. Yeah. They'd still eat the granola bars or whatever we bought. Yeah. Um, they weren't that healthy. There was, a, there was that one entity that, uh, you remember they brought in home baked goods like every oh, morning. Oh, One of those. I can't remember what I remember Bruce. Bruce's yeah. wife. Compliance man. It was like Valentine's Day too. Yeah. <laughs> His wife every night would bake and... The next morning, we'd have like fresh brownies, fresh cookies, and it was uh, like professional level baked goods too. It, it was yeah. phenomenal. And to top it off, so we finished the audit. We submitted a data request. You remember this? Requesting oh, yeah. the recipe to the chocolate chip cookies, and it was like it was like food. The the standard was food zero zero one or something like that. <laughs> we so that literally was, submitted a data request to the entity asking for that recipe. And they that was said, the one with the hotel with the train. That's how okay. All right, we were by the I end. remember. They all run together. It was. But, yeah, we ended up with this recipe. They responded, you know, to this. Yeah. That was, <laughs> this I think the response was something about that uh, was redacted or confidential information. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. No, wait, they had fun with that one. Yeah, we had a good time. At first, we were a little suspicious, though, right? Because, you know, you're bringing home baked goods. I'm like, they stuff a bunch of x lax in these or what, you know? It, well, they but, no, started was, thinking, like, what we, would, what we would do. Exactly. It was great. It was trying great. to think of, like, any good throwdowns in the audit room. Those are always entertaining mm. when you get a good argument over an imp- interpretation i remember the big one was over whether or not something was an oea or a new pnc or pv back then that was a big go between between the o and p and sip was how to handle those that one got ugly remember that yep there were those um i think there was a lot of discussion about you know cascading requirements too if you had a violation yeah. kind of at the parent uh and it you know like change management for example you know the violation there did it affect ports and services as well and you know, other areas. I know we had a lot of a lot of heated debate over how far does it go. You know, how that many was a big vi- one. How many violations? Six dash three, the R two, the spaghetti oh, requirement. Yeah. Where was the other? There was another spaghetti. Was it in seven? Yes, yeah, the, the spider requirement spaghetti. Do you hit every sing, everything on it, or you just hit the the parent? It was easier, but honestly, it's easier in V three to do it. Now in V five, it's yeah. The requirements are all still there, but they're all spread out, so it's kind of hard to cleanly hit yeah, that. But yeah, those were. Well, we were there for the transition from three to five. That was mm-hmm. that was a pretty big okay. mind shift, you know, to try and there's there's still a low key argument between Darren and I on one of the things in Sip Six. <laughs> I think we're on the same page now, but it's Cold War. We don't we don't talk about yeah. that one too much. Yeah, there's a wall built there or something. I don't know. Yeah, um, that was interesting going doing that. 
There's, yeah, there's, I think some of the audit discussions, let's say, spirited uh, discussions. I think the biggest ones were at our team meetings where we'd go through the audit approach. Because mm. once we yep. all came out of that, I guess stepping back, we had our team meetings every what, second week of January, somewhere around there. Yeah, usually in January. Kind of a stand down. Everybody would come to Salt Lake for all the audit, all of the compliance. Everybody under Connie White back then and Mike Moon, they'd come into Salt Lake and we'd have the all the yep. Kumbaya meetings. Then we'd break out for a couple of days on just the audit teams. and Yeah, work on audit approach. Had a giant spreadsheet for the audit approach that you were yeah. in charge of that, weren't you? Yeah, for a while. Just capturing that and kind of maintaining it. Yeah, that was that was that was always interesting, and and, and we did the interview trainings too. You remember that? We had some fun. Oh, with those that. were fun. <clears throat> it, was, it was yeah. We'd have different scenarios, you know. <laughs> Somebody'd have to play the bad guy, you know, or the the, the overbearing compliance manager. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't was really any names. Uh, oh, I nailed that one. I brought yeah. out my penalty flag for that one. The over the overbearing compliance manager breathing down the neck of the SME, you know, making the wrong answer. A lot of those interview training, but. The disturbing part was I think every single one of us were drawing on somebody in real life. Oh, yeah. So I'm absolutely not naming any names on that, but you know who I was drawing on. 100%. We had some fun in those. The team meetings were always good because you got everybody there and there, was, there wasn't there was the entity-facing side. So we got to let our hair mm -hmm. down a little bit more than usual, which we had no problem doing that in Salt Lake. That's actually, <laughs> I think, isn't that where all your hair went? Yeah. Yeah, it was. <clears throat> like Brent's yeah. doorbell. That was a good one. Yeah. A lot, yeah another thing a lot of people don't know. Um, Nick and I, this might actually come as a shock to a lot of people that he and I were kind of pranksters. Um, I know, it's so weird. Yeah, yeah. People, a lot of people just don't see it in us. I don't, you know, they don't see us in that light. But um, we screwed with Brent Castagnetto. He was our manager, you know, manager of the audit team, and we screwed with him a lot. Well, it's so much so that we end up, I bought two of the like football penalty flags that we would throw <laughs> out. Those were, if somebody got went too far, that was the professionalism flag, and Brian and I yes. each had one. Yep. How we end up in charge of those, I still don't know other than yeah, we took again, the impetus to go buy them. No idea how that happened. But, yeah, Brent had uh, <clears throat> somebody allegedly put up, like, one-way film on his office window because Brent always liked to look at himself. So those individuals thought maybe, hey, it'd be cool if we, like, mirrored the glass on his, on his window to his office so that yeah. all he could see when he's sitting in his office was himself. Of course, everybody else could see in. Um, that, was, that was very entertaining. Um, I think the yeah. best one was the uh, the little snap, the pull firecracker things. <laughs> yeah, with a little two strings, you pull them apart and it pops. Yeah. yeah, somebody, what did they do? Anything that moved in his office had multiple on there. <laughs> Fun part was he kept thinking, I think he thought that maybe it was just one or two, so he'd open it and get surprised. And finally, I don't know, I, he threw his hands up and just started opening everything all at once, just get it over with. Yep. Um, every drawer, every door. Yeah. Desk every chair. Room. There were, there were a whole bunch of ping pong balls that ended up in his truck somehow. Remember that one? I don't know what. No, that was, well, speaking of, of that, that was oh. one of our CPCs and one of the O&P auditors had the, the joke war. We were rank amateurs compared to those two. Yeah, that's true. Because there was a day that... That is true. There was everything in, in the guy's cube was Christmas wrapped. Mm -hmm. And his yep. response was to cover every flat spot in her office with a Dixie cup. All yeah. full of water to where there's like a little surface tension bubble on every single one. So an yeah. entire cubicle of just Dixie cups full yeah. of water. The whole was... desk is like completely covered. Oh, man. And then there was a saran wrap one. I know they did. They wrapped up everything. <clears throat> yeah. Saran wrap. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of time on the road. It's a lot of uh, a lot of stress. I mean, you're you're doing presentations, you know, here, there, everywhere. You know, whether it's at NERC or the SIPUG, you know, as we used to call it. Uh, there was just always a lot going on. You had your most downtime was probably, you know, December around that time when things would kind of plateau for a little bit and you're able to catch up, not to mention professional development. I mean, you, you layer all these things in there. You had to, you had to find some fun in the job. Yeah. August, October for me was always, usually I'd measure it. It was somewhere between seven and nine weeks straight of travel. Yeah. You and I did nine weeks one time. I remember that. Yeah. Cause we're you'd up, have all the audits Canada. kind of stack up. Like, we always had a break around the 4th of July. Yeah. But then it would catch you. And then you had all the professional development stuff for the security industry tends to hit. Security yep. and energy both. Yeah. And then going back to NERC for training. Um, you know, I, missed, I, I made it until I had two months left and Brent oh, realized man. I hadn't been. And that was his. That was Brent's farewell from WEC to me was, oh, yeah, you've come up with every excuse in the book to get out of it. No more. You have to go. Yeah, those were, those were entertaining. I'd say coming back on the stress part, you mentioned that. Like, I think the part that was hardest for me 
was when you'd go look at somebody's program and it was really good and they had just missed a technicality. And that yeah. just there's one of them. It still weighs on me. It still bothers me because it was a great program. They just missed one little thing. Yeah. Uh, and honestly, if it's if I'm king for a day, I'm gonna say, hey, just go fix that. But we had NERC and FERC observers that everybody's got a boss. That, that was one of those things. That was when you had those audits, those are ones that just didn't feel good. Yeah, those are the it it affected the dynamic in a significant way. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I'll say it depended on even who it was from NERC or FERC. There were some of the some of the auditors from from NERC and FERC that were really easy to get along with. Got a, you know. They understood how it went, and there were others who, you know, everything everything was a violation until you proved me otherwise. And, um, you know, they would take zero defect uh, to the extreme level. And it's very frustrating for us. You know, we're the ones left, you know, trying to build this relationship and partner with these entities, you know, evaluating their compliance, trying to help them improve. And you get somebody that comes in that just wants to absolutely slaughter everything. It's the guy. That, that was a tough one. The dynamic would definitely be different. Um, with them in the room. I remember the guy who was directing us data requests to write, and then finally Brent yes. stepped in and said, if you want to write it, you write it. Leave my team alone. Yeah. You can ask them. Yeah, you literally... can write whatever you want about them. They're not sending DRs on your behalf. If you want to take this audit over, by all means. Yeah. That was that was when I realized that as much of a, a goofball as Brent can be, one of the best people I've ever worked for. <laughs> Nick and I were talking just before this, um, and we can kind of wrap things up, but we're you know talking before this. There are a lot of stories. I mean, just just a lot of great stories, a lot of great people. Um, unfortunately, you know, you don't want to just name names and places and entities and things like that. But yeah. I mean, we'd, we'd been through pretty much every entity in the West twice, um, you know, not to mention all the offsites, but a lot of great people in the industry, you know, people that we're still good friends with now and keep in touch with. Um, but you know, fair share of very difficult individuals. I will say I was very disappointed when I left WEC and went over to the utility side and, and got got onto WICF and got behind the scenes on that because I was so disappointed <laughs> there were not threads for each auditor because I was, I had visions of like, all right, yeah, who's selling the Nick Weber voodoo dolls? Because there were some days that I'm pretty sure they're right. So hopefully everybody found this, you know, a little, little bit insightful, entertaining. Um, there's a, uh, there's a lot that goes on in the audit teams, a lot, you know, behind the scenes and uh, as there is in entities. I mean, we've, we've, you know, sat on the entity side of things and we see all of the action that goes on behind closed doors and, you know, especially during audits and prepping for an audit. So there's, there's just as much that happens on the auditor side as well and their preparations and, uh, you know, discussions and experiences, you know, things like that. So give you a little insight into that and obviously happy to, you know, share one-on-one, -on -one, any other fun experiences. If you happen to have a funny story, maybe about us, Ooh. it would be, it would be really good if, we had some of our old friends, you know, from the compliance world. Um, if you got a funny story, we'd love to hear it. Honestly, love to hear some of those that when we were auditors, you couldn't tell us. But now that we're done, hey, there was this one time when you guys were there on audit and we did or didn't, you know, whatever. I would absolutely love to hear something like that. I did have one of those. I know, I know there's stories out the week, there. First we got the grant, somebody came up, hey, you know how much stuff you guys didn't see? I said, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. So, yeah, love to hear from you. Uh, look forward to hopefully hearing some of those stories and that. But, yeah, so thanks again, everybody. Appreciate it, and we'll see you on the next one. If you know of a topic or someone you think we should talk to on Direct Connect, please let us know in the comments below.